Right. While you're doing that, I was going to tell you that one of the film festivals that I interviewed back in uh, March and April, you know, while I was trying to figure out what we were going to do was Steve Byrne at the Detroit Free Press about that. Uh, we, we talked to five or six film festivals. Because one thing we do, we're a classic film festival, so about 70, 80% of our programming is class, so-called classics. But we have new things, you know, documentaries, features, indie features. So I'm always kind of on the lookout. I, I didn't know you had done a documentary on uh, a Breed or on, on Ira Dorsey. Um, the last I heard about Ira Dorsey was I saw a story. Uh, there's a flint, like a digital flint news weekly i don't know what they're i can't think of their name but they're kind of an upbeat you know happy news kind of thing and they did a story on uh, ira and it never me never mentioned any of his notorious past and yeah, you're probably talking about the flint beat article something like that yeah mm -hmm. i get i get their i get a weekly email from them and i used to when it started i used to kind of read it to, to see what was going on and the other hometown, but they've gotten progressively fluffy and upbeat and it's like, I'm not learning anything from this. So I stopped reading. But when I saw that story, I thought, what a whitewash, you know, uh, the, the real story is more interesting, but. Yeah, okay, you know what, Doug? <laughs> Let's start with that. Uh, what, do you, what do you recall of uh, Ira Dorsey's notorious past? And well, they were, the Dayton family, you know, there were a lot of studio gangsters back then, right? Remember after NWA, gangsta rap really kind of permeated. And, uh, but they were, they were living the life. I mean, these guys were getting into trouble. And it was one of the um, interesting, you know, when you cover music for a living, you're used to somebody dropping a new record and then they're going to promote it with interviews and tours and videos and all. And their albums would come out when they came out and invariably at least one of them was in jail. And if they did perform, it wasn't always as a trio because one of them was, was tied up. And um, what I, I'll tell you what I remember going back. I moved there in fall of 90, like September or October of 1990. I had been working in Kalamazoo at the Kalamazoo Gazette. And I'd always done some kind of local music piece or showcase series, you know, to highlight local, local artists. And when I got to Flint, it was sort of in the downhill slide from the crack epidemic. And uh, I'd never lived anywhere that had real ghettos before. You know, I grew up in El Paso, which is uh, 80% Hispanic, 80% Mexican American. And uh, I'd never been in a popular, you know, when I was in Kalamazoo, it was, well, when I first moved there, I called a friend and said, there's a lot of white people here. You know, I'd been, I'd been a minority and I didn't know it. And when I got to Flint, it was more of a 50, 50 black, white split and racism was out in the open. And it was, it was, it was a slap in the face, you know, when you're new. So as I kind of got settled in there and started to get a feel for the local scene, because I wasn't really expected to write about the local scene. They wanted me covering Detroit, which is what took, you know, why I took that job. But, you know, I also wanted to get to know the community I was in and start writing about it. So what I was seeing in terms of hip hop was in the early nineties, kind of this transition from party rap and, you know, dance, danceable stuff, uh, starting to take a darker turn. And you had artists who, I can't remember a lot of them anymore, but you had artists who were, rap was their way out of the life they were in. They were, they wanted to get out of it. And that was a way to do it. Just like somebody else might turn to sports or something, but you began to see it creep into the writing. You know, for every nine studio gangsters, there was a somebody else writing about what they were really going through or what they were afraid of or having a friend murdered or, you know, things like that. That pretty chilling stuff, especially once you started talking to the artist to find out the story behind it, you know. 
um, so Breed was kind of that transition. He was, to me, never really gangsta, you know. He was more coming out of that other tradition. And the thing that struck me about him was his ability to freestyle, you know, or, or improvise, as they say in the uh, mainstream music world. Um, and who was the guy, the studio owner there? Do you know what I'm talking about? Carter? No, not Carter. Um, uh, Bernard Terry? Bernard Terry. Yeah, he, uh, he invited me out once to the studio and, and I talked to Breed there. It might've been one of the first times I actually met Breed. And he took me aside and he said, this guy can make up a lyric just like that, you know, which, you know, that's what Eminem is famous for is that ability to just, you know, uh, so that's what struck me. But Breed was like a lot of guys where he didn't really have good management. He didn't really have somebody who looked out for him, you know. So that, that's um, interesting that you, men, you mentioned Eminem because I also start on this path because I read this article from uh, Dr. Carlton Goals that talked about Detroit rap. Yeah. Um, he used to head up the Detroit Conservancy, but he wrote that, you know, before Eminem, there was this guy named MC Breed out of Flint, who was north of Eight Mile, who made it big before Eminem did. And I was like, who is this guy, MC Breed? And then I grew up in Flint. And so I had known about the Dayton family, but um, that's kind of one of the arguments I make in the documentary film, as well as in this book, is that MC Breed is the first commercial rap artist of the Midwest, and he established the, what, what I think is the Midwest sound. Can you talk about that at all? His, his contributions yeah. to Midwest rap? Well, he, uh, what, what I remember, because I got there around the time, I don't remember the exact timing, but it, I was relatively new there when I first heard about Ain't No Future in Your Fronting. And it was, and I, you know, I was getting billboard every week and, and you're starting to get to know people. So like I'd met Bernard and Carter McBride, who had a store called the Music Planet. And um, these are kind of touch points that, that you need if you want to do your job right, you know, trying to write about your community. And um, uh, I think if I remember right, I got the album. It was on, was it on Ichiban Records? And it was, I got it on cassette, I remember, and uh, eventually got it in another format. But the song was, you know, it's one of those songs that kind of like an instant earworm type thing where it just kind of gets in your head right away. And then you start playing it over and over. That was the hassle with the cassette. You had to rewind it and play the song again. And then you're stretching the tape as you do it. Um, and so I remember starting to put column items in about it. I think before I even met him as it was working its way up the billboard rap charts. And I don't remember what they called him at that time, but um, you saw it starting to kind of inch its way up. Pardon me, I'm gonna turn that. And um, somewhere along the line in there is when I met Breed and did a story about him. And I think that that's when I talked to Bernard, Bernard this sort of um, innate freestyle ability that he had. He just, he got a rhythm and he could make shit up, frankly. Um, and then stylistically, he continued to change, to evolve. Part of it, I think, is like any artist where you're trying to grow and take it places. And then sometimes, you know, he and others would sort of follow what was popular. And you could, you could hear that later in his career where he sort of maybe wasn't quite sure where to go. You know, he did that, he did that duet with Tupac. That was, I gotta get mine. That was a good one. And, and frankly, in Breed's case, because of his management issues and his bankruptcy and all this stuff, he did, did need to get his, <laughs> you know, he did, he wasn't getting what he deserved. You know, there's a guy in Flint, Clio, suburb, question mark, question mark in the Mysterians, who is a guy who, got screwed out of royalties early on. He doesn't live the way he probably should. And, um, you know, in a way Breed was kind of, Breed was a living version of what all these other 
generations of music stars had gone through where they got ripped off by a manager or somebody and they they didn't know you know they this wasn't their area of expertise they were great in the studio not so not so much with a checkbook you know he was uh, if i remember right he was signed to multiple labels at the same time do you remember that i i know that he went through a series of independent labels he started uh uh, his first record with the Funk Crew, um, I think it was picked up by Ichiban, but it was originally um, a Flint label. I can't recall, what, but yes, yes. Yeah. He had multiple, multiple um, studio labels. Yeah, and I think, I think if I remember correctly, there was a period where he had signed multiple deals at the same time. And there were legal issues and he was, uh, he was advised, I think, by his one-time manager to file for bankruptcy to get out of all of that, you know? And then he was, he was scraping by for quite a while, if I remember right. I would check in on him every once in a while. How's it going? What are you up to? What are you working on? I dropped a little item. I used to do a column once a week for the Flint Journal, and I would drop items like little updates about Breed and other artists in there, you know? Um, but he was the one, for me personally, he was the one that really kind of made me aware of a scene in Flint. And it was also, um, it was underground in the sense that mainstream media had no idea. And most of mainstream media in Flint when I got there was, was a middle-aged and older white people who had no real connection to anything outside of their sphere, you know? Um, Whereas my thing was my journalistic uh, approach was to try to reflect your community to some degree or another, wherever you are. When I lived here before, I was writing about Tejano music and some of that, you know, scene that was going on because most of my predecessors didn't do it. And um, when I was at Flint, to give you an example, when, I don't know if you remember one of the many times uh, rumors went around that Luther Bandros was dead before he actually was dead, uh, there was a radio DJ in Flint who was, oh, I heard this. And he's, so I was getting all these calls from people about it. And I reached out to um, his publicist and management who, you know, he is not dead, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I wrote a story about it. And some guy called to thank me for it. Some reader called. And when I answered, he said, oh, man, I thought you were a brother. <laughs> I was like, Why? <laughs> because I was writing about something of interest to black culture. Um, so Breed was kind of my ticket into that in a way, you know, I wrote about him and then you start to hear about other artists. And so you track them down, hey, can I get a copy of that? We'll, we'll do a story about you. And I did that, I, I remember covering a hip hop show in Saginaw that Breed was on and I had my notebook taking notes for the show and I had more than one person come up and ask me if I was a cop and I would show on my Flint journal ID. No, 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 I'm reviewing the show. I don't remember who was on the bill. I'd have to look it up, but, um, and that was kind of what made me aware of like the Dayton family and other artists. The Daytons were pretty notorious. And one of the first times I met them was when um, one of the, <laughs> One of the phenomena that they were experiencing was that they were so hot in an underground sense that these fly-by-night promoters, mostly local guys, would do flyers for shows claiming to have the Dayton family on the bill, and they weren't. And I remember them coming to the newsroom. It wasn't bootleg. It was um, Shoestring. And who was the other guy? I can't think of his name right now. Uh, was it Matt Hinkle? Matt Hinkle. Yeah, Matt Hinkle. Um, we met, I think Matt Hinkle, we met at the Flint Journal newsroom. They showed me examples of posters for shows that they were not part of. And they said, people are, you know, trying to rip us off, you know. And I remember thinking at the time, I guess it's a form of flattery, <laughs> but it's a not too good form of flattery. You know? Yeah. So I, I only know MC Breed through his, through his work, and, and I did have an opportunity to interview his partner, his longtime partner, uh, Natasha Gisbreed. But um, what, 
so if can you like breathe life into MC Breed? What was he like when you met him and and uh, got I guess dropped in on him throughout the years? Yeah, it was. Uh, we probably spoke as much on the phone as we did in person. What I remember about him was he had this very to use uh, a 70s term, laid back kind of personality, at least in my dealings with him. I never saw him get too worked up about anything. Even when he was going through, he was, it seemed like he had a lot of trials and tribulations. Money, you know, I remember he got popped once, I think for marijuana possession or something like that. And I talked to him shortly after, I think after he'd been released and you know, he, he would go through this stuff, but you wouldn't, you couldn't always tell by the way he talked. Like he, he just kind of rolled with these things. This is on the outside looking in. Um, I can't say in what I remember, I don't really remember him ever sounding overly down, but I also don't remember him sounding overly wound up. You know, he was just kind of even keel, at least in my dealings with it. And one thing I appreciated about him too, you know, when I talked to him, as I recall, and I, I would ask him, do you mind if I put something in the paper about that? Like he was working on a track or he was doing this or he had a gig somewhere. He didn't call me up to get publicity so much as it was, how's it going? And it wasn't like we did this all the time. It was just occasional, but it probably was like that for, I, I remember, I, I would say probably a good chunk of the time I was there. I was there from 1990, fall 1990, to the very beginning of 08. And um, I can't remember when he died now, but he died, I think, after I moved here. And I remember, you know, just thinking, you know, this is so tragic because this was a guy who seemed like he got dealt a pretty raw hand. And it's too bad that, you know, he got the better of him. It was a heart attack or something, wasn't it? Kidney failure. Kidney failure, wow. Wow. I, I do remember, you know, I've been gone from there for a good 12 years. And I remember having some friends back in Flint reach out to me, did you know Breed died? Because I didn't see anything, you know, in the news about it. And I, I just remember feeling real sad because he, he was a good guy who had a lot of bad things happen to him. And some of it I imagine was stuff he could have controlled and some of it was the industry he was in. And, you know, when he made it, you know, when he first made it with Ain't No Future In Your Front and, and he moved to Marietta, well, all the, the scene here was just anti-breed. They were jealous, but they felt like he had sort of deserted them but he was doing what everybody else was going to do if they had had a hit too, which is get out of a bad place and go to a better one. That was, I think, the view. But he got trashed a lot, you know, before that. You know, it's too bad because he's really the one who kicked open the door for these guys. You know, I don't know that the Dayton family guys felt that way, but I heard it from others. Maybe that's why I don't remember their names anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to think, you know, after you reached out to me, like, who do I remember, you know, and of course him and the Dayton family. Um, another guy who came to mind was Jake the Flake, who, if I recall, was from Flint, and he was kind of doing his own thing, kind of in the, in the milieu, but kind of carved out his own little niche. Um, and then DFC, which was the kind of the spinoff of uh, the defunct crew and they they had a label deal with big beat if i remember right i remember getting a promo item from atlantic records which distributed big beat where they sent you a plastic bag filled with dirt and a little plastic shovel and it was tied in with the name of the the project the name which i can't think of right now digging up dirt or something like that. yeah that's a, interesting that you bring up uh that empty Breed was being trashed <laughs> because yeah. I, I had also heard that um, from Natasha um, Gist Breed in that uh, she was saying that Flint did not give him any love mm -hmm. and um, who so it, it, these were 
rap artists who were trashing him or was it? Yeah, mostly rap artists as I recall. And the reason that I remember this is, so understand that when I was a college student, I went to Texas Tech University in Lubbock. Lubbock was not my favorite place to be, but it had this really good music scene, both in terms of local music and then the artists who came through on what they called the Texas circuit. So you had these Texas bred singer songwriters and guys doing their own music as opposed to covers. And then the clash or somebody like that would come through because they were friends with Joe Ely, who was from Lubbock. And so I really learned to appreciate uh, local music and write about it there. And when I went to, um, and that was a very supportive, small but supportive scene, came back to El Paso, wasn't really much of a scene at all, which is why I ended up in Michigan. And I first landed in Kalamazoo, and Kalamazoo had a good, small but good supportive scene, particularly in what I would call the indie rock arena area. And um, so that's why I started a series there I used to call West, Te West Michigan Music, I think I called it, where we would profile a, a local band or, you know, maybe a country singer or a folk singer or whatever. It's just kind of an occasional series of profiles. When I got to Flint and started to kind of get the feel, you saw this jealousy thread that ran through not just rap and hip hop, but any music. There was a pride in Grand Funk Railroad, right? Because they were hugely successful in the 70s and they came out of Flint. But when they reorganized, they had been separated for a long time and there were factions people took this guy's side or that guy's side and, and it was weird, <laughs> it was weird. But you saw it in, in several of the musical areas in Flint, these, somebody has some success, the others are jealous, so they lash out. And I thought, well, this is why you guys don't have a better scene than, you know, cause you're not supporting each other. And that changed a little bit towards the end of when I was there, like with the machine shop, for example, uh, helped helped build a scene in that style of music and because Flint to me when I got there was a lot like El Paso when I lived here was hard rock and metal and Mexican music and then when I got to Flint it was like hard rock and metal and rap and there was not a lot of other stuff there was you know rock but those were the areas where the activity was going on I would say the creativity was going on people doing their own thing and, and that's, I think one of the things that got me about Dayton family was, it was really hardcore stuff. When they talked about guns and things like that, you know, they were not making this shit up. And, but the beauty in that group was if you saw them live, the three together, and they performed live and I saw them live a few times, but I only saw the three of them once or twice. I had never seen rap that tight before like you talk about a band being tight these guys would do something in unison or then break off two and one or whatever and it was it was like they sat down and wrote it out but they didn't <laughs> you know that was what made it so impressive i saw them at the capitol theater once and i forget what show it was but that's what i remember is that image of those three guys going at it at the same time it's just like wow it's like watching a jazz band you know it was just too bad that they weren't all three together, you know, consistently. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I remember about them, but fuck the police was a big underground hit for them. That was another one that, you know, climbed the, the national charts. And, and if I remember right, that one and a couple others lived on the charts for a while, you know, kind of on the, the, the bottom half, but, they didn't really have big distribution or anything like that. Anyway. What were some of the reasons why, well, MC Breed um, went down to Atlanta, but um, for the most extent, uh, aside from their um, felonies, uh, the Dane family didn't break out on the national scene. Um, what, what were, some of the factors that contributed to that? I would guess a lot of these artists really didn't have management. They didn't have those 
they didn't have the pieces of in infrastructure that you need. Like in other styles of music, there's more of a tradition of that. In rap and hip hop, less so. I mean, I think that's changed. But back then, especially on the local level, regional level, there was a lot less of that kind of thing. So these guys, they didn't know how to manage themselves and they didn't have a publicist out front, you know, getting the word out. And imagine if these guys had come up in the day of social media, how they might have, you know, had a different fate as far as that goes. But there was none of that stuff. MySpace was barely around when these guys were going on. Uh, so I think a lot of it is that you also, radio didn't play this stuff. Commercial radio didn't play it. And they didn't have to. You know, the, the big um, R&B station in town, they could have good ratings by default because they were really the only R&B station in town. And they were making good money and they had no incentive to do like a rap hour. Um, I don't remember public radio much in Flint. There, there was a public radio station, but it was part of the University of Michigan system. Uh, when I was in Kalamazoo, by contrast, they had a really good um, low power FM station called WIDR, which was interdormitory radio. And that was where you heard Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all these guys before you heard them on MTV, you know, and they would bring these artists through town and play at a place called Club Soda. So they had a, a little bit of infrastructure, but we didn't, we didn't really have that in Flint, especially in the hip hop scene. Um, and it, you know, I don't know, I assume it's changed, but even when I left there beginning of 08, it, it really hadn't changed. And a lot of these groups had kind of lost their momentum. Uh, we had acts when, <laughs> when I was there, um, as gangsta rap began to become more of the commercially dominant form. We had acts that I knew, one, one guy in particular, and I can't think of his name, but he was a suburban black kid who got a degree in business from Michigan State. And when he first started, when I first met him and wrote about him, he was doing party stuff, party raps. And then just like MC Hammer, <laughs> he started to try to go harder. And it wasn't very convincing musically. And I remember when he got pulled over for a taillight infraction, driving back from Lansing to Flint, he, he, he sent out a press release about how he was being harassed by the police and all this stuff. <laughs> and you couldn't find any evidence of it anywhere. Uh, it was just really, basically, he was doing a vanilla ice, I think, trying to trump up a story because it gave him more credibility on the street. And that's where you had to have your credibility. That's where your sales were, people buying stuff out of cars, literally buying out of trunks of cars. Um, have you talked to Ray Furlow? Is he still around? No, I haven't. I don't even know who that is. Big Cheese was his name. Big Cheese. Okay. Big guys. It was Ray Furlow, F-U-R-L-O-W. Okay, and he's a rap artist? He was an entrepreneur. He, he promoted, um, he supported a lot of these guys. Um, for me, he was kind of one of my portals into that community. Um, you know, there was, when I was new there, there was a lot of skepticism of a white guy in his thirties who wanted to write about them. They were protective and I understood it. But Ray, Ray would tip me, to check out this group. He brought Run DMC to a club called the Copa uh, downtown. And because I was one of about three white people there, Ray walked me in and walked me out <laughs> just in case. <laughs> me, a white suburbanite guy with a, a you know, young child at home. Like, eh. you know, you just don't know what you're walking into. But I, I was in a lot of shows where I was one of the few whites there. And the first few times I was nervous, then you get more acclimated and you're comfortable. I was more scared at some of the heavy metal shows just because of the uh, the mosh pits that would get out of hand. But at the beginning, it's a little little intimidating. Um, but Ray, he promoted shows at the Copa. I think he had a night there, like a Monday night or something, Sunday night. Um, 
knew a lot of the acts. He was close to the guys in Ready for the World. Um, another act that broke big out of Flint for a few years. Um, and I understand now they're in two, they're in two, ba two acts, Melvin Riley and Ready for the World and Ready for the World and Never the Twain Shall Meet. It's like Grand Funk all over again. <laughs> there's two grand, there's essentially two Grand Funk railroads now. There's the one without the guy who sang and wrote most of the songs. And then there's, you know, they have a sound alike singer and then there's Mark Farner doing his thing. Um, maybe there's something in the DNA there, I don't know. But with the Dayton family and some of these other groups, the Dayton's had some national distribution. I don't remember the name of the label or company that they got it through, but they put out a few albums, I want to say, on the same label. And uh, I'll dig through what I have left in my collection to see if I can find them. And if so, if you don't have them, I'll, I'll pass along what I find. I've lost touch with Ray Furla, so I'm not sure how to find him either. Yeah, that would be great. So I I read an article that was um, that was headlined "Adios" that you wrote when you were leaving, oh. and you mentioned um, MC Breed, you mentioned the Dayton family, and this uh, Run DNC show uh, at the Copa, and you also mentioned a band called Top Authority. Uh, do you, Authority, yeah. Do you remember? I'm yeah, do you remember them at all? If so. Um, you know, what was their impact? And the name, yeah, and um, I don't remember why, except I want to say they were more of an R and B act. But I let me let me dig into that a little bit and refresh myself. I had when I left Flint, I had a massive collection of music, so it was CDs and albums, you know, vinyl and stuff, and I had a a large Flint music collection which I left in Flint to donate. The idea was it was supposed to go to the Flint Public Library. I don't know whatever became of it, to be honest with you. Um, I wanna say that Joel Rash was going to do that for me. Joel had Flint Local 432. I'm still in touch with Joel, not lately, but, um, but that, that was the plan is that why take this 2,000 miles away where it's not doing anybody but me any good? And I was essentially getting out of that game, not necessarily by choice. My uh, father had died. My mother was not handling it well. We were offered these generous buyouts at the Flint Journal. Um, I really didn't want to leave because I loved what I was doing, but I knew I, I needed to. So, um, even after I moved here, I still had a very large collection of music. And then in the last few years, I just gutted it. It's down, it's down to maybe 2000 titles from between 15 and 20. And I sold a lot of it off through a, a record store here in town. Um, but let me, let me go through and see what I can find and let me jog my memory on top authority. I'd kind of forgotten about that name until you just mentioned it. So. Let me see. I can I can pass on any of this stuff as I re remember it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Have you kept up um, up on at the Flint hip hop rap scene at all in, in the last few years? Not really. Um, when I moved away, I did for about three years, maybe, and then. Um, as often happens when I move, I sort of eventually my mindset shifts to where I'm at. So I worked at the El Paso Times here from 2008 to 2013. That's where I started as a college kid in the 70s. And, um, but they, you know, they had no, uh, they had no need for a music critic, uh, but they, it was my observation from reading them for a few months, they had no need for any kind of arts and entertainment coverage at all. They almost acted like it didn't exist. So when I hired in, I eventually took all that coverage over. So I was doing what I used to do back, you know, right out of college, which was writing about visual art, dance, music. But the music scene here, which was different, you know, you have a lot more Mexican rooted music and some really interesting stuff that hybrids traditional Mexican with indie rock and um, now I get to hire bands 
I run a film festival and we do some outdoor movies with live bands opening. Last year I hired a band that mixes indie rock and mariachi music and they have their own sound, <laughs> you know, as you can imagine. So, you know, just stuff like that. And, um, uh, but not to the degree. So over time I've lost track. And then occasionally, like when I saw that story about Ira and I thought, well, they don't say anything about, you know, what he's known for, what he was, what he was known for. He's obviously cleaned up his life. It sounds like. And um, when I heard about Breed's death, you know, that was one of those where um, you don't, expect to hear something like that because i was definitely older than him probably by 20 years and and then when you do hear it you know you feel sad because you knew what this guy was like but you also knew some of the stuff he went through and how it unfair you know um the top authority it, it it has a positive connotation as you mentioned the name but i can't think of why so let me let me work on it I, I just wondered if you'd heard of any of the uh, the up and coming rap artists coming out of Flint, like um, John Connor or Lyric to Queen. There's um, Mona Haydar. Um, if you uh, John Connor, I've heard of, but I don't know anything about. And the other two, I'm not familiar with. What? So what's the? You're, I know you're in Lansing, but you're not far away. What's the? you know, infrastructure like there now. Is there one? Has has that evolved or is it the same? So uh, in speaking with the up and coming rap artists, especially John Connor, who was dropped from um, just a little backstory on him. He uh, was on Dr. Dre's label, but he was hmm. dropped from it recently. And now he, he's opened up his his own studio or reactivated um, all varsity sports studio with team Cleves. <laughs> so he is, uh, yeah, mentoring um, some up and coming artists like Belly Beretta is one that comes to mind. I, ha I have not um, I had an opportunity to interview him, but um, yeah, I have just heard from him that he feels like uh, the the hip hop scene in Flint is going to be um, emerge. It's going to be big. It's going to be like the golden age of Flint hip hop, which is, which was in the early nineteen nineties, um, because they're they're gaining their its own identity with its own flavors and sound, which is which to me sounds um, far away from the gangsta yeah. and funkadelic type of sounds that MC Breed was famous for. Um, so one of the, you know, one of the reasons why I contacted you was, was, um, somebody who I interviewed who is up and coming. He's, he's 30, but at, at times he feels like a, um, so he's old. yeah, he feels, yeah, old school compared to some of these um, <laughs> younger rap artists, but his name is Nicholas Shemis. He goes by oh, Shemis. Yeah. And he said, he wanted me to ask you <laughs> if I got an opportunity to, to talk to you, if you still have the tapes where, <laughs> where you interviewed him. I think he was uh, when he was 16 years old. So. Shemmy, man. How's it going, man? <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas Shemmy. So he, he would always say, it's a Shemmy. And he was, he was doing some promoting, too, if I remember right. Oh, okay. He didn't talk I think, I think. Yeah, I'll, I, there's a name I hadn't heard in a while, but I, I can hear him when you say that name. I, I, oh yeah, I remember that. He was one of those guys who called a lot, oh. which I didn't know. <laughs> Question mark would call almost every day. What? And he would call and you'd answer the phone and he'd say, so to make a long story short, and then he'd go on and on and, and we tolerated it. And he, he used to talk about, the people from the future told him this, they told him that. And I'd always say, Q, the people from the future tell you I'm gonna hang up. You know, that, that's how he knew it was time to stop. You know? And uh, he was a character. But yeah, I remember Shemmy. I, I uh, probably, if I dug around in my emails, I might even find a few things from him from like when I first moved back up here, moved down here, I should say. Um, that's, I just kind of forgot about him. There was another guy who was involved in the scene, not as a performer though. I think he, 
I want to say his name was Thomas, something Thomas, and he was in a wheelchair. He was a shooting victim. He was a white kid who I think took a bullet in the spine. And, but he was involved in the music scene and particularly hip hop. And there, there was a guy who I still get stuff from occasionally. And I, again, I'd have to look him up, but he had a magazine called T Real, T R E A L, a T Real or Trio. But I think it was T was from his name. And every once in a while, I'll get an email for something that they're doing, something that like, like an online version or something. So I'll usually look at that stuff and then I'll look at it and like, I don't know any of these people and, you know, move forward. But, but just so you know, um, when, so when I was new here and I was covering all the different arts, which I hadn't done in many years, uh, one of the events I covered was this film festival I now run, which started in 2008. They had, uh, the city and the people I work for, the El Paso Community Foundation had uh, raised $42 million and restored an historic um, movie palace downtown, kind of like the Fox Theater in Detroit, but half the size. And I went in to check it out because the El Paso I had left would have fucked it up. You know, their friends would have gotten the contracts and then they would have cut corners, and, but they did it right. And it reminded me of when I covered the restoration of the Fox Theater in Detroit. They did a true restoration, it was gorgeous. And this theater uh, was hosting this festival. So in 2013, after the original director quit, I was approached about taking over and running it. And I had no background in doing that. I had a lot of background in writing about those things, but they said they would teach me. So once I made that transition, um, all that energy that had gone into music and arts and all that shifted into movies, which were always a secondary passion. And uh, I kept thinking that my interest in music would rebound and it has a little, but not, you know, not like I thought it would. Um, I think some of it was that, you know, when I look back now, I realize how much work all that was that I listened to so much music that I didn't like. And, um, but that's how you find great stuff, right? Is you have to be open to everything, but it was a lot of work and I kind of, like not having to do that anymore. <laughs> so something comes by and it, it'll grab my attention and I start listening to it, but it's not like it was, you know, in 2008 when I left there. Well, I hope I can share Read and Bootleg because I think that you'd be interested in especially um, the latter part of MC Breed's life because I really feel like he was, he was about to make it big again. Um, but so could you send me the, your top 10 favorite rap artists from Flint? Yeah, I, I need to fill out that form too. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I can come up with 10 at this point. If it, okay, if that's it, fine. 2007, I would have said, can you, can you let me do 15, you know? But um, I went through, like I looked through, I keep a log of all the concerts I've been to and I ran across a few things like, oh yeah, I remember that show. And um, I was trying to think too about any influence from Detroit because we heard about Insane Clown Posse a lot more than we heard about Eminem until Eminem broke nationally. He was, you know, it was not a name you heard and Kid Rock was doing more hip hop type stuff at the beginning. And I remember he played at the local once and you know he had maybe 50 people there <laughs> you know it was he was on a label at that point but he wasn't he wasn't known you know um and i don't know how much detroit influenced flint i think flint was kind of doing its own thing and if it was influenced by anything it might have been some of the uh gangsta stuff coming out of southern california you know, like like nwa and things like that but these guys like i thought dayton family were totally original personally that's what I remember. But I'll get you the list and uh, I'll do a little more digging on some other stuff. I'll, you want me just to email you things as I kind of run across it? And how can I see the documentary? Is it completed? 
It's done. I am having issues right now, uh, not only with um, film festival stuff, but um, uh, one of MC Breed's, um, I think his, yeah, his, uh, his manager, his initial manager, having a hard time getting um, a release form from him um, so that we can use his video, his, he, his film called The Dollar that he starred in. And um, a lot of his, yeah, music videos are under um, his, his management. So he says it's been on the way, but it's been on the way that form since March. Which uh, manager? Who is this? This is Leroy McMath. I remember that name. He was the, uh, he had, uh, was, was he Ishaban or was he uh, Power he, Management? Power ma Entertainment. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, uh, yeah, so I'm keeping it close, but, you know, if, if you say you want to just take a look at it and not share it with anybody. Um, I can, I, believe me, this is what I do for a living. I've got stuff sitting on my computer right now that I have to delete in the next few days. Uh, we did, um, one of the things we did, uh, are you familiar with Khalid, the R&B pop singer? Mm -hmm. So he's from here. He's not originally from here. He's an army brat, but he, he made his first album here at a local studio. His mother was in the army. They settled here. And so he was embraced here and he considers this his hometown. Um, so I work for uh, the El Paso Community Foundation and we had a mass shooting in El Paso a year ago on August 3 that was racially motivated where a white kid from suburban Dallas drove 10 hours to El Paso to kill Mexicans mm. and shot um, 23 dead, 25 wounded, and a lot of traumatic, you know, post-traumatic type injuries. And so I was involved in a task force that oversaw the donations. It was like $12 million that, and how they got routed to the families of the victims and all that. And um, in that process, we worked with Khalid's uh, management and his mother who runs his foundation and he did a benefit concert here and donated half a million dollars to uh, education scholarships for uh, children of the victims and so I got to know these people and they gave us or he he and his label and his manager gave us permission to show a movie that he did to as a companion piece to his last album, Free Spirit, which came out last year. And the movie's got the same title. And uh, we had a digital component this year to our festival. And that was our lead off kind of feature, feature film. So I still dabble, <laughs> so to speak. But I'd love to see it if you're comfortable or if you want to wait, and let me earn your trust a little bit. I can see it and I can delete it um, or whatever, but I'm, you know, I'm curious because Breed I always had a soft spot for. And with the Dayton family, I had a lot of respect for them, especially their talent. But, and Shoestring was the one I think I dealt with. He and Matt were the ones I talked to the most. Ira was kind of elusive. <laughs> he was in and out, you know. Um, but uh, I didn't have the relationship with them personally that I did with Breed. And... Um, I'll see if I can track down Ray Furlow for you, see if anybody knows where he is. And, you know, I have all my old articles, but none of them are digitized. They're all in boxes waiting to be digitized because I wish I could find a few things that I could share and just say, hey, I don't know if you saw this. You know, um, I may have to dig through some boxes and see if I got something I can scan for you. Um, okay. Well, you gave me some homework and uh, I'll work on it. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. So I, I do have one question now. I know that we've gone way over, but um, can you can you tell me about what that Run DMC show was like? Uh, what I remember, I mean, I told you about, you know, being a little nervous going in and going out like that because it was a club I'd hardly ever been in. But it was not a big club. You know, I think they could only get 200 in there maybe. And I... Um, they were down on the floor level. There was a small stage and I stood up. I don't know if you'd call it a balcony, but it's sort of like a balcony level. And what I appreciated because I had seen them before, but on larger stages, 
was how well a they interacted live with each other because they were in a tiny space but also the energy of the audience you know people there knew that they were getting something exclusive you know i've been to a few of these things like bob dylan in a club you know and um when you're standing up above it you not only can see it but you can feel it uh it's something that the first time i had to go out in front of an audience and introduce a movie um like a thousand people out there and i was scared shitless and you feel that energy and it was kind of that same thing you know where i'm sure it felt different for them because of their perspective but i was kind of observing it all and getting that feel so that's i remember that more than specifics except that they family they had this sort of unity about the way they performed it wasn't just random like some some hip hop acts look like they're just kind of they don't know what they're doing up there and so the hype man is you know and they're just like oh, you know raise your hands in the air and all the clichés they weren't like that that i remember they weren't like that i'm sorry was this the Dayton family or Run DMC no it was Run DMC but but it reminded me okay. of that same kind of vibe you know same thing uh, i hadn't thought about that concert in a long time but you know i felt like i was let in on something you know like i had a golden ticket <laughs> yeah you know what that's um that's history <laughs> well it definitely was flint history yes did you say you grew up in flint i did grow up in flint and um i interned for the flint journal in 1991 and then uh contributed some stories do you remember cookie washa yeah that's who i worked for yeah, so I freelanced some stories for the entertainer um, when I was in college. That so, was the question that I wrote for with Ed Bradley. Ed and, and, and uh, another gentleman, I, I also, I, I contributed to his stories. He was more of like a health styles type reporter. I've been trying to think Bill, of Bill Christine. <gasps> Bill, Bill Christine, K-R-A-S-E-A-N, I think. You know what? I want to say K something, but it will come to me. But um, Doug, I, I, I am going to send you a link to the film. And you know, if you don't like it, no big deal. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I just think it's, it's such an incredible story, um, MC Breed. Yeah, definitely. And, th and those two guys, you know, if you were to single out individuals, you know, one out of a group, those are the two that would come to mind. You know, Ira was a compelling individual, not just because of his, you know, his record. <laughs> no, no, he is a, a charismatic character. And that's why that the fame, the, the film uh, became about him. <laughs> because yeah. he was just, oh, so, so yeah. good. But Doug, thank you so much for your hour of time. And we're gonna keep in touch, I hope. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, what I'll do is use during my downtime, I'll dig through the collection and see what I can find. And I, per I probably saved a few things, probably the stuff that meant the most to me. It's usually how I make those judgments, you know. Um, and I'll, I'll see what I can turn up. I'll send you whatever I run across that might be pertinent. So. That would be amazing. Okay. Thank well, thanks you, a lot for the project. Yeah, well, you were a key ingredient. You, you've also pointed me to a bunch of other people I need to talk to, so. Okay, and if I find any context for some of these guys, I'll pass them on, especially Ray. Yes, yes, okay. I, would, I would really appreciate that. Okay, well, thanks, good luck. Yeah, thank you. See you later. See ya. Bye.